instrument application blindly. If you're applying someplace, you should know somebody who knows somebody there to find out what's going on, what is the atmosphere, what are the chances of getting hired, what are they really looking for. You really need to have lots of information and all that stuff comes from basically interacting, going to conferences and interacting with people. Poster sessions are fantastic. You get to talk to people, but it, 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 it cannot be emphasized how much personal information is personal connection is important. Because people should read that recommendation, but if they read the recommendation with somebody, they know. Okay, so make sure if you want recommendation, you know, basically find out, you know, it, it, it should be get a conventional advisor, but if there are other very prominent people in your field, try to get acquainted with them also. It's usually not very difficult. It's, you know, it, it, you know, basically, uh, it, you know, unless, you know, you are, but most people, there are many very decent people who are, you don't know, mind talking to the students and you can, uh, get, they get to know you, and that really, it really helps. Uh, but the other main thing is, the bottom line is, in the end, you will be hired because they think you're really exceptional in that particular area. Fortunately, it's a very competitive world. So, if you're looking for, you know, from an academic position, you have to be pretty much one of the best people in this field. So, pick something you really are interested in and really do an outstanding job. It really cannot be a you don't just do what you're told. You know, work in a field that you're really enthusiastic about and make sure that you accomplish something significant. And for example, if you finish to get your PhD and uh, you, you feel okay, you, but you, you, you don't think that you're go do something else. Do a postdoc. Or my suggestion is you don't have to go to academic position right away from graduate school or after a postdoc. It's okay to go to a, find a place where you can really accomplish something significant. Okay, there's many research laboratories in the industry. Not, not every laboratory is equivalent, but if you see a place where it's doing something which you really this and you can really excel, then go for it before before you actually go for the final for you for academic position. Before you get something significant and when you accomplish something, then don't be shy about telling the world about it. But again, on the other hand, I'll be very careful. I've heard a number of times, I've heard people interviewing, and they said, I did this with a collaborator, I did this with another collaborator, and they didn't mention the collaborators before. And I thought this was a, you know, if somebody helped you, you give credit. Because the colleagues, I was thinking, you know, he's going to be my colleague, he's going to talk about our collaborative work as a collaborator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So make sure you have to be, you know, act decently, obviously. But make sure you have something, make sure that you actually feel that you accomplish something very significant at this point in the game. And you know you're not shy about it. Okay. I agree with everything that is being said, and, and so let me probably repeat some of it and, and emphasize at some points. Uh, the first important step is to pick a good school where to do a PhD, and you've already successfully passed it. <laughs> Second important step is to pick a right advisor. Uh, somebody that is, who is respected in, in, in the field that you want to do a PhD, who is highly respected. Because the name of the advisor, name of the school, number one, and then name of the advisor counts a lot when, when applications are, are received. That's often, when I look at applications, that's one of the very first things I look at. Where and who was the advisor? Yeah, so, so bigger. A good, of course, at many levels, there's no question, everybody is very good, all the faculty are very good, so, so I guess there's no, no question there. Uh, third, pick a good problem. Of course, often the advisor will tell you what to work on. If, if, you, if you can, at the time that you, that you talk to the advisor to, to get hired or something, if you can put your suggest some more like some ideas you may have, you have to do a lot of homework before for having that kind of good discussions with the advisor, and for most of you it might be too late because you're an advisor already and you have the project. But, but it's important to work on, on, a, on an important problem. On an important problem. If you do great work on an unimportant problem, it, uh, that will not make much difference. If it's an important problem, which means also by the way, probably other people at other places are working on it. Can, can, can do a big, a big, a big breakthrough there. 
it doesn't make a big, a big difference. And then once you have the problem, do quality work. Of course, of course that's very important. Do quality work on that problem. Now, it's not enough to do good quality work. You want your, your work to be known out there. If nobody knows about it, then that will not be very helpful. How do you get it known? You, you, you submit, you, you convince the advisor that we get you know, submit paper to confidence, you convince the advisor to give the funding to put the confidence, and then you can tell your advisor, I will not cost very much, I will, I will share a room with two other students, and then I will not eat much, and then I will come with a low cost airline, so, 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 so please uh, send me, and I can participate a little bit. Uh, and anyway, please send me to the conference. Okay? And then, as many people said, at the conference, you, you, you want to, 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 to talk, you want to go to people's talk, of course, to keep people in your area. Right? Before that, you must have done your homework, of course, also, and do well to keep people right? in your area. You can go, go to, to their talk. Um, if you can ask a question, of course, it's a should not be a completely dumb question, but otherwise if you can ask a question, that's very important. Okay. Uh, the, the, and, and, and the question might not be that, that, that deep or so, but if you ask, ask a, a good question. Some other people in the room, so who are typically faculty members, also graduate students, but faculty members at the various universities, we will maybe ask each other, do you know who that person is? And, and, and so people will, will start knowing your, your, your name and, and remember he this great question even though he's only a, a PhD and maybe a first year, second year PhD student and understand talking to his advisor, he's a junior third person maybe but a great, great question so, so there's something and then you know maybe we start, we start it to, to be known after the talk, if, if you have this talk, it's just an area that is not much interest to you, you go talk to, 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 the, to the, the speaker. And, and if they have, maybe there may be many people around him or her at the time, maybe it's, it's hard to get to him. But you can go later, right? Go, go to the person, I, I like your you talk very much. And by the way, I am working, working on this, and, and roughly, there's a few things about what you are doing, and of course, you have a car, but most people do not have a car. But uh, repeat your name several times. Okay. Maybe especially for Chinese people, because it's hard to remember <laughs> Chinese names. <laughs> uh, okay, so, 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 so that, that's, that's one way you get known by, by people. Another way, and uh, I didn't quite hear everything it was said here, but when, when, when there are lots of talk being given here, there are, there are people who are invited. And lots of well-known people are invited, they, they, they give talks here. And, 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 and usually the talk lasts for about an hour, those people are, in, are here for, for the entire day. Okay. And usually there the, the may be a gap in the schedule. And I know that when I invite somebody, I often have a hard time filling the schedule. Okay. So go and talk to the host, I mean, do that beforehand. You see a talk by this person, and one of the faculty is going to be the, the host who to, 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 to say we very much would like to, to, to have a chance to, to, to talk to a person. Uh, you could even join for lunch, right? And you can talk over lunch. If you don't think that you want half an hour just between you and the person, you could have other friend of yours or other graduate students together with you. We meet the person for half an hour. You can, you can tell the host. Could we have a group of us meeting with the host for half an hour? Okay. And, uh, and, and, and so you, when you meet with, with a person, of course, you want to say a little bit about the research that you are doing. And then, very important, and, and so that was something uh, uh, the top five of the said that. Uh, the next day, or even the evening after a person is gone, send email to that person. Uh, this is great to, to, to meet, meet with you, and by the way, this is a copy of the paper that I will tell you about. So, so, if you that. so that's the, the way you can start a network and start to get people to know and have, have people 
have said, when comes the time of your application for a position and you will need reference letters, reference letters from the advisor, of course, it's always very good. Okay? They will not pay much attention to that. Okay? From other faculty members here, uh, they will pay some attention. It is good that, in fact, you should definitely talk to more than one per per person here. Okay? And in fact, it's partly for that reason that we have now the proposal exam, which forces you to have now three people who kind of know what you are working on. Right? After a proposal exam, you should go and start interacting, possibly on a regular basis with, with other people, and get, get, get input from them. Um, let's see. I lost my train of thought. So, should send me to these people. Uh, so. uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so, so uh, other faculty in the department, the, 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 that's, that's better than your advisor. Of course, just the name of your advisor counts, but the, the content of the letter is known in advance. I don't have to read that either. <laughs> but other faculty, okay, that counts more. But people from another school, that counts the most. Okay? If you have somebody well known, especially, from some other school, who said great things about you, that will make the difference. What about people from Windows? Most cases, if you're not. As much, except if that person is very well known in, in research circles. Okay? It's in the research department of industry, does yeah, the work with things. Yeah. Yeah. So somebody who goes to conferences and, and Like from Microsoft Research or like Google Research or, you know, these people are really, uh, they publish. Yeah, or go to public. Provided it's an outstanding person in the field, and not everybody is an academia. I want to take the prerogative to remind you of what Steve Marcus said earlier, who was on the first panel. And his advice was, when you're, when you're starting to do your application, do your homework. Go to your advisor, go to all of the faculty members in the department that you know, and you can sit down with and say, okay, tell me everything you know about this institution. And then in your letter, in your research plan, you should be emphasizing, you, you should at least mention the people that you could have a connection with in the department. because. They, they, once they receive the, two, the pile of 200 applications, they have to know who to send that to to evaluate it, right? So you should be mentioning specific people in the department that you have a connection with, and you should also be talking about future research plans that would not that that, that people could see happening in that department, right? That would be feasible to happen, and maybe that would even have some connection. It doesn't have to have a connection. I'm not on the panel. I just wanted to remind you of what Steve Marcus said. He, said. he said, go and at, you know, ask the people that you know here, tell me everything you know about this place. Because having those connections, right, it's not about, it, like, from, from your perspective, I know it sounds like it's old boys network. It's not old boys network to have a point of contact, a point of knowledge. The point of knowledge is important because it provides a basis for understanding value Quality. That's why that point of contact is important. Is because otherwise you look at two credentials on two pieces of paper and it's very hard to tell the difference. And that's very helpful up to the point that you go to the interview. At that point you, you are on your own. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'll, so but before we pass, so, so we're going to go, or the, or if there are any questions, please um, ask questions. Otherwise we can go for a second round of tips. Um, I'm going to take the chance to give you my one networking tip. As a graduate student, you should be going to conferences, which has been mentioned before. Um, as a young faculty member in this department, I, um, I, I was lucky enough to go to one of the same conferences regularly as one of my senior colleagues. And I would stand next to him at the conference so that I could meet the people who came up to greet him. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> Choosing the right problem and the right area is very important. I mean, again, as uh, 
uh, uh, for example, again, I come back to my example. I think when I was on the job market, I got, got faculty position so easily, primarily because the area that I was uh, in, that was really hot at that time, uh, network, communication network in 2000. So, bottom line, I mean, uh, but of course, there are classical areas where you there will always be jobs. For example, uh, a couple of years back, we hired someone in uh, classical information training with outreach to machine learning. So uh, th that would, I mean, I'm not saying that you should always chase the you know, next thing on the horizon and forget all the next areas. No, but uh, they become, uh, I mean, let's say the academic craze about different areas change. It's a fluctuating thing, and uh, you can get a job even if you're in classical area, but it's just it, it becomes much more a matter of Also, you have to be quite good. I mean, excellent actually. Yeah, not that you have to. You can get an academic job without being good at what you're doing. But just, the, just that. Level. So the point is that uh, uh, working in a research area, which is important at the moment, will take you a long way towards getting an academic job. And of course, the uh, the problem there comes. But then, of course, then there is natural question: How do I know that you as Joining a uh, PhD. At that point, you, I, mean, I really don't think you'd be experienced enough to know what is really an upcoming area. So that's really very, it's, it's sometimes I don't have a good answer to that, but many times you get a feel by talking to others that uh, this is really emerging uh, in the area. Uh, that said, you must also, it's really a trade off, you must also follow your passion. Because it doesn't, if, even if you're in the hottest area possible, but if you haven't done a good job in it, then, I mean, there isn't, I mean, I don't think you can really get, uh, get a good academic position. So you must do a good job, and also you, when you are hired in that area, so it is the expectation is this, that you continue in that area for some time, and it's also to your benefit that you have built these credentials in the area, you don't want to change and work in something else next, to, next day. That means you have to be passionate about it, to continue in that area. Yes, and you have to be productive. The job is stressful, but it must be rewarding. And the only way that can happen is if you're passionate about what you do. So it's all things uh, combined. So you need to work in a in an area that is appealing, uh, that is generally appealing, or that you know, your job becomes much easier if you work in such in such an area, in an emerging area. But at the same time, you must follow your passion. And if I really, really have to choose, I will say follow your passion. Follow your instinct. That if you are really passionate about an area, you want to do it, you should do it. And uh, you know, I mean, uh, worst case, you might not get an academic job, but it's not really an end. You can do. There are uh, several other very rewarding professions. You can do. So if you have to choose between the two, that if you are really being tested in an area, but you don't know if it's an emerging area or not, if you are really passionate about it, I, I would always say go for it. Go for the instinct. Okay. But generally speaking. It helps a lot if you are in an area which is, uh, let's say, academically hot. At, at that point, or I mean, bear in mind, you will be, if you're joining that area now, you will be in the job market about four years or so. So the, uh, the area needs to be hot for that time. So and these are all variables no one can, uh, can predict. None of us have any crystal glasses. We can give you bare estimates, but that's not it. So, so there are lots of uncertainties. But uh, but I think the first bit, uh, the hard order bit is two or three.
you know, by the time you, you finish, you might not have, have achieved enough goals to get your position. So at that point, you can reevaluate your uh, your objectives. And you can say, you know, should I apply now? Or since I really want to be a professor, maybe it's worth waiting, getting a really good postdoc, or staying one more year to publish this extra paper that, you know, if I get this result, I think I could have a very, very good job talk that will make the cut. Also during the process, uh, we tend to underestimate the importance of communicating the research form. Proving this bound or doing something is one thing, but if you cannot talk about it, then you're only going to know uh, yourself. Uh, your office may know about it, but the rest of the world will not know about it. Right? So you need to be able to connect your research problems to real world applications, and you need to be able to talk about them in a way that people really want to listen to your ideas. So communication is not very important. Of course, communication without quality is nothing. But you know, if you have the quality and don't have the communication, you might be losing some very, very important opportunities. So you, keep, you need to keep in mind you need to do presentations, to practice your talks before you go to conferences, even how to talk to people about your research in general and conferences, right, in a way that it's not tiring for other people. Right? So you get to the point very precise. Yes. Um, yeah, so a lot of people have talked about homework, uh, but I think they talked about homework for the application process and post interview. So I have a lot of homework that you need to do to prepare for the interview itself. Um, so typically, here's the list of interview questions. I mean, every university, every department kind of has them. They're all more or less the same. First question, why do you want a faculty position? Second question, what is your research? What is your research plan? What is your five-year plan? That kind of thing. Third, something about teaching, for sure. New, new one these days, diversity. How are you going to deal with diversity in the classroom, in your research group, all of these things? You need to prepare answers to these questions. Um, something else you have to prepare for. Like, what do you, what do you need when you, when you get this position? You're going to have to support a lab, buy things for your lab. You should have a list. Be prepared to discuss the things that you want and how much it costs very, very important. And um, another thing, I mean, you should be, this is again part of your interview questions, I mean, if there's something that's, that's new and hot that just happened, you should be very, very much aware of it. Like a new story, something that um, is very, very crucial to your field or your area, you should be able to talk about it freely, think about your answer very, very carefully, how your work impacts this area, uh, or how it could impact this area. Um, so my advice is to prepare very carefully for these types of questions. And I'm sure that people who are on the search committee in your own department can tell you there are similar questions, and you just need to think about them uh, carefully for Excellent advice. Um, the next category of advice would be is be uh, professional and mature in the application that you submit. So there's some things that are obvious, like your research has to be fantastic. Um, you have to be There's a lot of other things, though, that make an application package look good. Um, teaching statements is one of them. Um, having teaching experience is another. Before you apply, um, ask around um, for what opportunities, and there are a lot in the CE, um, for teaching, for, for being a TA, for being more than a TA, um, for filling in for, uh, for a professor's class, for Coming up with some some new ideas, just so that you can you can see what it's like to teach something. Anything that you can do that shows that you know that you care about teaching and you've been trying to teach is something that will make your application stand out among other applications that are similar in every other way. It's not that teaching is the most important thing for most faculty in the department, but there are some faculty that it is the most important. And there's a lot that it really matters. So if you show that you are going to be, that you care, and that you have been looking at this. Um, another aspect of your application is most of the faculty who will be reading your application are going to be reading dozens of applications now, and have probably read 100 applications or so in their career. 
So they know what a good application looks like, and you don't have any idea what a good application looks like when you're starting. So it's very easy to write one that sounds good, but um, you just pass it around. Give it to your advisor, give it to your advisor's collaborators. Um, say, is this the kind of, of application that when you see it makes, makes, makes an impression or are there fatal flaws of this? Um, this? This is the kind of thing you have to take so not personally. You have to go, please tell me what is wrong with this application because I want the application to be good, to be as good as it can be. I, this is not, my application, even though it, it comes from me and my heart, it's not about me. It's about what I can say and what I can communicate to you. Um, when, you're, when you're supposed to write what your research is like and what the five your plan is, ask faculty, especially new faculty, what they wrote. If, ask them if it's okay if they, you can read what they wrote. Ask them if it's okay if they have good ideas, if you can borrow them and go on with them. There's, there's nothing wrong with this and there's everything right about it because, it, again, it shows that you a professional that you care about communicating with the people who are evaluating your application what they do. Okay, so one of the important things I mean, when you get into the seminar, and uh, I've heard so many unimpressive seminars in my life that it's actually exceptional when somebody gives a really good seminar. And there is no reason why you should be able to. Because the question of learning what to do, how to do it, it's an art. And unfortunately, it's usually not taught. I was lucky at home when I was working at government laboratory, and they sent me to a course, like a two course, how to give a seminar. And we don't, I don't think we have anything like this in here, but we really should. The most important thing, which I have never heard anybody else say that, you don't bore your audience. Okay? Now, you are very eager to tell them all the technical stuff you accomplished. Most people in the audience, especially during seminar, maybe one or two people in the room really know yourself. Most only have a vague idea what you're doing. And uh, most of the time, the speaker just goes off and loses the audience and sees the and see. That happens so regularly. Don't do that. Okay? Don't bore the audience. Think. It, 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 it's not kind of a, it, it's not a natural art. You have to think about what is interesting about my work. If I'm going to tell them something, don't try to tell them everything you know about the subject. Tell them what is really interesting. What, yeah, otherwise, you know, why are they going to listen, okay? There, there is a, don't know. Okay. So, um, there will be few people in the audience who are experts You have to make sure you impress them also. But that's, that, that's minor. The main thing is uh, give a proper introduction. Why are you working on the problem? What is the problem? I've seen so many times, you know, they say, I'm working through it. There are a couple of acronyms and something, and I have no idea what they are. So, absolutely, uh, the person who taught the, the course which I took was actually used to be a stand up comedian before he decided to teach you. To teach you. People have to give seven. It's the same thing. You know, you lose the audience, you pour them. You know, they, they, they don't care about it. They, they start booing you. Well, in this case, people are all just fall asleep. Okay? But again, it's something, giving seminars is something you can learn how to do. First of all, you need to have a mentor, you need, and you need a lot of practice. So whenever you have an opportunity, give a seminar, teach a class. I mean, teaching is also pretty much a giving seminar, but it, 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 it's an art. So the, the, the most important thing, okay, so what I learned is, first of all, don't go to the audience, and second, there must be logic to your presentation. From the beginning to the end, everything must be connected. Don't just give a bunch of random facts, just in case. There must be a reason. You start with something, start telling a joke. You start producing something, and there must be a punchline. So make sure that you have an... It, it doesn't happen automatically. You have to plan it out, you try it, work it out. But you put a lot of work into planning how you present it, how you stand up and how you present yourself. Those things, you forget about those things. When you're, when you're worrying about technical aspects, when you're talking about technical matter, and you're thinking about what's the relationship between different variables, that's not important for the audience. More important, are you looking at the audience? Are you listening to the questions? If somebody, if, 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 if also somebody has a question, pay very careful attention to what they ask because it means that they're having trouble following you. 
tell them the, you know, so redirect if necessary. But the main thing is that you have, to, you have to put a lot of effort into it. So just like preparing applications is important, you must practice and prepare for the seminar, which you're going to give, and you'll be giving a lot of them in general over your career. And it's not, it, it's not something you start naturally. It takes practice, and, and, you know, and that's for advice. You know, let's say, ask somebody, a couple of people to listen to your seminar before you give it. But the main thing, there must be a good story. You have to tell them, why are you doing this? And if, by the way, and if you are not that enthusiastic about your work, nobody else is going to care about it. So, you know, if you did several projects, and some may be more important, but you know, that, that it is it. Talk about what you it is it. The most important people are looking for an applicant is passion and energy. And if you don't convey that you're really enthusiastic about it, you know, it's just not right. By the way, the, 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 the two people in the room may understand the technical details of your talk. Most likely, you get to meet them one on one, and then you can discuss the technical details there.
page number, the next one does not feel like that. You should try to, to be very, very consistent because that shows that what you have decided for a certain format and now you are using the format. It's not that, okay, let's write this one like this, no, this one maybe not, maybe it looks better like this. Okay. So, so in a way, the, the content of the CV, of course, you cannot do anything about it at the time you write the CV. But the, the way it's written, you know, so you can do the whole first italics and bold phrase and the spacing and all that, right? So it's easy to do. So we, we've touched on a lot of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that you have to put together. How to choose an advisor, how to choose a research topic, how to find mentors, how to write your, you know, how, how, how to network your conferences, how to write your papers, how to write your letter, or how to choose reference letters, how to, how to write your CV, how to write your research plan, how to write your teaching plan, how to, conduct, how to make your presentation once you get chosen for an interview. Okay, you've got to have questions. <laughs> Thank you. 
teaching, so I think you have to show a consistent track record of teaching, but I may not be the best equipped to uh, suggest that uh, because I haven't really been uh, reviewing applications for such. So it is understood when you apply to a research coming from a research school, right? It is understood that the teaching opportunities that you might have had might be limited. For example, it would not seem weird if you had taught the whole class by yourself. People will understand that you're a graduate student, so this is not how things can happen. Also, I've seen this thing happening, but you know, this is not the this is not expected. So, you know, whatever you can get into your application that relates to some things that you have done, no matter how long ago it was, you should try to put it in, right? And then you know, you can also talk about it during the interview if you want. So, you know, at that point, you just do whatever you can. Thank you. But, but at the same time, just like being in the lab, if you're a postdoc or in this lab, you can say to whoever you're working with, I would really like some teaching opportunities. If that's okay, can I, can I fill in for you? Can I, it, are there opportunities? Please keep me in mind. And then that's a line in your CV, and that's another, another sentence when you're talking about teaching. Yeah, um, I personally really enjoyed uh, teaching. Part of the reason why I was staying in the school system, but I know the fact is like the university, especially research universities, this is really like a, a less important part. So I would like to ask the PS here: It's like in the U.S. system at least, is there any room for people who have more passion about teaching, but still like not be you know have a teaching tenure track? But it's, I, I just feel like very information. Absolutely. So, so, the question is, uh, what is the best place professionally for someone that uh, really, really likes teaching? Like, right? Is this the question? Yeah, it's like mentoring, yeah. teaching, and doing research, you're doing that, but um, there is always like, I mean, my overall impression is you have to be excellent in research activities, and teaching is kind of like another associated activity, but um, but I'm wondering uh, if there is still room for people to focus on more about teaching, you know, like that. Maybe someone, I could ask a panelist to explain the difference between different kinds of institutions, yeah. like a research one institution versus more of an undergraduate teaching yeah, liberal arts colleges, for example. Yeah, so liberal arts colleges. For so, so, so there are certain uh, universities in the United States uh, that are called liberal arts colleges uh, that are focused, let me give some example. Uh, I would say like uh, sophomore college, Pomona College in California, uh, bring more in Pennsylvania, right? Uh, uh, Smith College in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, Grinnell. Yeah, so this, this college is focused mainly on teaching and they don't have very strong research programs in particular, I think they, they don't have a PhD program, but I, I might be wrong. So this is where you get hired because of your teaching skills. Uh, the, the research part is, is downplayed. Also, you are expected to do some research with undergraduates. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Does that address your question? Research intensive yes. universities, they found body teaching, but at the same time, I mean, they pay more attention, at, at least in the hiring decision, they pay more attention in, in the research. Right? I think this is gradually changing, but still, I think the most important part, I will be having a first of Maryland, I will say, is research. Thank you. Yeah, there, there, there's one other exception, too. Uh, there are non tenure track lecture positions at research universities, too, where you just basically just teach. I mean, there's not the same stability as the tenure track position, because it's not tenure, but, but, or salary. But, but if you really love teaching, I mean, that's, that's a position you can you know, almost do. And it's a, it's a good service. I mean, that's why they hire the lecturers. So it frees up faculty to do research. I can also, let me just also mention that community colleges, I mean, in, in, certainly in this area, we have very strong community colleges. And they actually aren't paid so badly. They're paid pretty, the faculty at community colleges are paid reasonably well. And most of what they do, they do some research, but most of what they do is teaching. Okay, I just wanted to uh, fill in the 
job that teaching is not just teaching a class. Okay. That's an item in your resume, which is, looks very good also. If you interact with undergraduates or high school students, that's very, very often professors don't mind having taken during the summer some undergraduates or some of the year or some high school students, but usually somebody has to supervise them. And supervising an undergraduate or high school student is also teaching, actually. So you should basically, if, especially if it's a well-defined project, you take responsibility for it. Um, you know, if you see somebody score a number of undergraduates, you know that this person really is interested and passionate about teaching, because that's something which doesn't help directly your research, and you do it because you really want to do it. So it's very important to, to the, the other aspect of teaching also. It basically, and usually, you really teach when you interact one-on-one -on -one with the student. You know that, okay? So that part is really important. And again, if, and if you supervise number of, or, or interact with the number of students, that goes as another item in resume. I'd like to just pause for a second to thank our panelists who's party.
but at the same time, um, it's uh, the number of offers that you will get is likely to be small, and it would be nice to have some choices and good to have some experience. And so you should maximize the number of offers that you can get. What you see in the paper can really change once you visit the place. So, so what you see in paper when you're applying, you just see, you know, some application to the institution, but if you get an interview, so you might think like before, oh, I, I'm never going to go there, but then if you visit, things might change because the people actually can make a big, big difference, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's an experience and you just go for it. You know, it's one year of your life and, you know, you just go for it, right? I mean, probably the only time you're going to experience that, so, you know. When you go for an interview, they interview you, but you also interview them. Because you really have to see if you like this place or not. ready for the interview too with your questions <laughs> not just to run, to answer their questions they know you're also interviewing in other places so they're also doing their best to keep you right to, to attract you so they also have to perform not only you and nothing makes you look more attractive to a place that you'd like to go to than having an offer from somewhere else yeah yeah that was the Psychologically, that's really important. <laughs> Additional questions? So, is it necessary to become a host before you apply for an academic application? I know it's not very good question. But as a current application, I'm more and more content. So, he's asking about postdoctoral experience. I, I know that we have some diversity of postdoctoral experience up here, so I think we'll just go, we'll start on this end, perhaps this time, and then we'll move down. Did you have postdoctoral post -doctoral experience? No. I said no, I didn't know. Julius? No, I went to, uh, I got a job in a government research laboratory, which is an excellent place to do research, and uh, I was very happy there, and all of a sudden, the opportunity showed up, and I interviewed them, they gave me an offer. So it took it. So it, um, it basically it, it's a matter of uh, opportunities, and nobody can predict when your area is going to be hot. When I started doing research, uh, the area was it was completely dead. There was oversupply of people. People were getting quit. Uh, anyway, uh, when I graduated, there were, there were no university positions, just government laboratory positions. But all of a sudden, there's lots of opening. It's just, it, it happens about you, you, you have to kind of monitor what is going on in the field and make sure you're productive. So if you take a postdoctoral position at some place which is not particularly good and you don't really you think you're going to be flourishing there, you're going to do very well. Don't take it just for that. Most, I think most important thing is that uh, I, I, I recommend thinking basically finding jobs in industry or government laboratories which uh, provides a certain degree of stability and you, where you can do good research. Where you can be, where you, so basically, if you're not ready for a academic position or an academic position, find someplace else to be for a while. You know, you don't have to, you, you can enter the academic world, uh, academic uh, uh, system at many different levels. But of course, provided you're advancing the whole time. Okay? So you have to go to a place where you think you, you will be better, you will grow most. Okay? So, uh, if there is a fantastic, especially if the area you're in is, you, once you, when you get your PhD, it's not necessarily in the area you're going to end up in. Okay? So once you get your PhD, you have to decide what you want to do then and see which way you want to grow. So if postdoc really helps you, then you go for it. If not, look for other kind of jobs. Okay, that's it. Uh, Jonathan, did you have any postdocs that helped you grow? Um, yes, yeah, so for me, postdoc experience was absolutely necessary because I changed directions significantly. So that, that, and that's a good reason. If you have in the field you got your PhD and you feel that that is not what you want to do, or you feel that it is what you want to do, but it's not as hot as it was when you started it five years ago, and you want something to, to complement that, or to add to it, or to give you more breath, those are very good reasons to do it. If, if you don't need it and you're employable right out of your PhD, then that, um, to take advantage of that. Yeah, 
too, much, too many things to add to that. I think everybody explained it pretty well. Um, I did do a postdoc, but I was in a field that was hot at the time, and I did apply these positions and get them. And it's going to vary by field from field to field and from topic to topic. Um, I guess I would suggest you don't do a postdoc for too long, though. I mean, you want to do it for two, maybe three years max, and then you want to you be a life, lifelong postdoc, right, a research scientist. You just want to do it for a short amount of time for these reasons that they mentioned it. Yeah, I had the postdoc. Uh, I guess I evaluated, you know, my status when I got my PhD and decided, you know, if I want to have uh, some better chance to become a professor at, uh, uh, you know, top university, then it's better to a postdoc at a really, really good university. <laughs> so I went to Brown to Berkeley. So I guess, like, you know, it's it's really important to go to a, to a much better university than the one you're getting your PhD unless there is a very, very specific group you want to work with. So, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it, it, really, it really depends how you feel when you get your PhD and it's, uh, what are your aspirations, right? It also varies by field, I'll mention. Yeah. It, I mean, it's very typical in the biological sciences to do multiple postdocs. That's right. Because many departments will not hire a new faculty member until they're ready to get their first NIH R1 grant. And the average age of a new NIH R1 awardee is over 40. Yes, I've had done postdoc and um, back in, in my time, just years ago, uh, chasing my type of area, it was not typical to do the postdoc. I've seen faculty position. Times are a little bit harder now, I think, uh, including in systems area and, and uh, number of recent students have done a postdoc and then got on to family position. Uh, so, so for a postdoc, you can, can gain a couple of things. You can, can acquire more knowledge and experience in the research. You can add to your CV and also turn to your CV. With you had it in the sense of feeling ready to for an academic position. But also, and for the second reason, you should definitely not do your postdoc in the place where you do PhD. Do your postdoc in some, some other place, some, some good place, and with good people. And, and then, hopefully, two things there. You will learn from those other people. You will learn some, some, some other aspect of your feet, uh, and and you will get well-known people to know you, right? and that, that, that will help you also uh, because uh, more more people will take care of the support application for the position. So suppose our position I think, can be very helpful. But they, they should not be in your own school. It should not be for, for, for too long. I think two years is not the general the, the max. So, Not some time, you know, the humidity and the pressure that you get in the assistant professor, right? And, and, and you can grow first, and then growth will help you in, in, in the pressure as well. So I'd like to segue to another related question, given that there was earlier advice, if you don't get an active position right away or don't want to do a postdoc, that you should go into industry or government. Um, I'd just like to pose that question to the panel as well. Um, do you think do you, do you think that it's a good idea to go into industry or government? For how long? Under what conditions? Do you see people transferring for, from those positions into academia? Yes. Uh, I think I have to agree 100 percent with the two views. Uh, the idea is you go somewhere where. That's what they evaluated. 
as long as you can publish. Yes. yes. In many, so, uh, so many industrial situations, and sometimes in government situations, you have a restricted ability to publish. Ah, it yes. has to be considered yeah. very carefully. Exactly. Like in, I mean, these days, in many industrial situations, you can't publish because it, as a person working in industry, if you publish on a certain topic, then there are categories of companies called patent trolls that will come in and start trying to patent everything they can in that area and then try to block your company from being able to be active in that area. So, so it, it gets more, much more complicated when you're working in industry or oftentimes when you're working in government these days, your ability to publish may be very limited because you may actually be working on something classified and you can't publish in the open literature and then that, or you can publish in the classified literature but then your work product can't be available during the job application process for an academic position. So you do have to be very careful about it. You can do it back to work, but if you cannot publish it, so that will hinder you from going to an academic, to an academic position. Right? But then again, so there are a number of quite a number of government laboratories which are not classified. Yeah. This, for example, I mean, you have to be careful. Uh, years ago, there used to be the labs in industry which published everything. You know, the, the, uh, it, it varies, but uh, yeah, if you register academic position, you don't go into classified work. <laughs> That's obvious. And, and there's are not Bell Labs now, but we have a little bit of Microsoft. Yes. Yeah. You, you can work for a company and publish your research. Very good. Yeah, and aside from publishing, you want to place it to board events and allow you to go to conferences, ideally without you know, taking your own vacation or something. That's supportive of things like that. Because again, visibility is really, really important, so you have to be out there. Can, can I add something about just reminded of? Of course, of course. So, so um, Dr. Abshire mentioned grants as something that is useful in some fields. In academia uh, these days, the securing funding is almost always important. Um, you need to be able to have RA money. So if you can demonstrate that you are aware of this and that you have secured some sort of funding, even if it's small, that's also very positive and it shows well. If there are small sources of money from industry, if Amazon is giving away money for this, if Google is giving away money for that, that you that you that are competitive, that you have applied for, even if you don't get it, that's something, but if you do get it, that demonstrates that you're aware that this is a need and that you have skills at it. And that also makes you, it, it's not just that it makes you look better, it shows that you're better than some of the other candidates who apply to the competition. Yeah, I'm sorry, I left this off the list of important questions. It's where are your sources of information to be. So you should actually outline that carefully before you go as well. It again, shows your maturity, shows that you're planning, shows that you're ready. If you don't want to get into an academic position and then start searching, yeah. Beforehand, you'll be overwhelmed with so many other things. It, um, a follow up question that's a very good suggestion. So, um, but if you know, okay. oh, can you move closer? Yeah. Sorry, so, to be, <laughs> if, if you apply from, for a funding or something, it's, it's supposed not supposed to be able to over as well. Is that like, a, like um, morally okay? It's, it, it, it's morally fine. The actual mechanisms it may depend. It may be that a certain, like, like Amazon says, that once the funds may I research, it has to be a faculty member. But you can say to your postdoc advisor, I would really like this money. Can I write the application for you? Right? And then that's that's win-win. And then you say you wrote the application, which your advisor does. Right. Yeah, it's always a good experience. Frustrating, sometimes, which also makes it a good experience. So much of this does the cold the eye sometimes, even if you're a postdoc uh, in certain cases. So, in this situation, you can also formally say that I was a cold the eye in this grant we received. Yeah, even if it's small, or I mean, no matter no matter what size, but showing that you've been involved in the process and that you've begun to understand what it takes to put it together is really valuable. Thank you.
I'd be happy to share my experiences, but my first word of advice is do not do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, my PhD is in physics, and I was in a very really fun, interesting field of physics, but it was very small. And in my field, there were typically, there was typically a faculty opening a year in North America. And so I, I really liked this. I was very good at it. I tried with the other dozen or so postdocs um, looking to get position and faculty positions. I got an interview or two, and at some point I decided uh, this is not strategy long term. Um, I'm, I'm not immediately advising about these other 10 or so people. And so I changed fields completely into engineering neuroscience. And that required doing another post-op from scratch. And I'm really glad I did it. For me, it was a great decision. But it's not a, I don't think it's a good general strategy to get a PhD in something, do a postdoc in it, and then completely turn around and change for now. But it, it certainly can be done. But it, it shows well that me. it can be done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it works very well for me. <laughs> and it shows the diversity of paths, right? I mean, you often think of this looking for an academic career as a very homogenized pathway, which it need not be. And when Simon's first PhD was in plenarized relativity,
not over the course of a five-year PhD, but over the course of the last year or two of your PhD, if you can shift to be relevant to one of those, then maybe you have a higher chance. But apply anyways, that's a virtual apply. So who, who is determined here to be a faculty member? <laughs> yeah. When will you start? Uh, when will you start applying? I think I'm the one who's So um, I want to demonstrate something. It's on video, right? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Who are you working with?
spent his retirement doing more outreach related things. And one of the pieces of advice that he gives to young people is go to conferences, network at conferences, go to the talks. When the talk is over, be the first in line to ask the question and ask a good question. Because that's how people notice you and that's how people understand that you're paying attention to their work and that you're a smart person. Yeah? When I said that, I should have given credit to Centauri. <laughs> that, was, that was Steve Centauri's advice. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so. Sometimes to ask a good question sometimes involves doing a little bit of homework before the day of the conference. Sure. You often get the PDFs of the papers the PDF, before. Read it and yeah. be, be prepared and make a good question. I, I once asked a question at a conference where I got more applause for my question than the paper. <laughs>
then you have much better chance of getting that. Um, the job of uh, private in the research institution is, in my opinion, the best job in the world. Yes. Uh, you have to put a lot of yourself in it, but because you, 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 you like, I mean, you do not go to academic life if you don't really want to teach and want to do this.